God, touch him. I thank you, God, for letting Brian, Brian to come home. God, Brian, Scott got to come home. As we prayed with him and did surgery with God, she let him come home. That little fellow was on that forward wheeler also, God. But God, I'm praying for, for Brian. And God, touch him tonight and his family. Help them, God, I pray. Others, Lord, these names I've called out tonight, God. You know the need that every one of these gives. I pray for Ricky Fortenberry's sister and her, her daughter who's in the hospital now. God, touch them and heal them, Lord. Others, oh God, on this list tonight, we may have failed to call out. But God, we wait patiently on you for the answer, God, for the healing, for the help that you're going to do. The benefits that we have in you, God, tonight. One of those, Lord, is the benefit of our healing. We pray for that healing for these righteous people tonight. Frank Patterson that couldn't be here this morning, but his lovely wife and daughter came. Brother and sister Cub Pepper wants to be here. And God, because of sickness, they're unable to do it. I pray for the arms. I pray, God, for these people with Brenda Cobb, Lord, that needs healing from you, Lord. Sister Bernice that's lost her husband needs a touch from you. I read. Stir up, God, that's in the hospital now, Lord. Touch it. Clear up these lungs, oh God, I pray. Breathe into her that breath of life you give her in the beginning. That these lungs will be cleared up, Lord, I ask. Things that are healed, God, we'll give you praise. We'll give you glory. God, touch somebody's heart in this service today. God, you were in this room this morning. Somebody went out of this house, oh God, today that needed you. And I pray, God, tonight, give them that second chance that they'll surrender to you before it's too late. All these things that you do for us, we give you praise and glory and thanks. We ask in Jesus in your lovely name tonight, thanking you for what you're going to do. Hallelujah. Amen. Take a minute to welcome our visitors as you this time. Good to see you tonight. Hope you're doing well. I didn't want to mess with that contraption, so thought I'd step to the side. It's good to see you. Glad you're here tonight. And uh, we're thankful and blessed that the Lord's presence is here. His promise is where two or three are gathered in His name. How many came in His name tonight? Well, He's, he's right here in the middle of us. And we're thankful for that. Don't forget the news and highlights, the things that are happening. Don't forget uh, prayer meeting tomorrow night. Then we're having a roundtable discussion on Tuesday night over in the dining room about ways that we can uh, reach lost people. It's just a discussion. There's no agenda. We just want to talk and brainstorm a little bit. It's going to be unique because we're going to do a roundtable discussion around rectangle tables. So it's going to be good. It's unforgettable, I promise you. We're going to have a great time. 
Uh, so just keep in mind all those things. I know Joy Club's Thursday night. Just a lot of things that are happening this week, and we want to make sure you, you, you're aware of all of those things. So make sure you get one of those that has all the information in there that will help you. Our rushers are going to come and wait on us tonight. We thank you for your continued uh, giving and gifts that you uh, help us with, your tithes, your offerings, your other gifts. Uh, we say the words thank you. We hope that they are more than just words to you. We hope you understand and know from our heart that, uh, that we do thank you for joining together with us to do the work of God. So we're going to pray at this time. Our ushers are going to come to receive our gifts, and we're going to worship the Lord as we do it tonight. Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you that you are an awesome God. We can never thank you enough or praise you enough. I know I say those words all the time, but that is my heart. Lord, if my vocabulary was vast and expansive, I still would not have enough words to express thanks to you for your blessing. It's not always a monetary blessing that you give us. It's not always, Lord, a blessing of this or a blessing of that. But, Lord, to wake up in the morning and to be able to get up and have strength and energy, to be able, Lord, to, to get to the place of the house of God where we can be in a safe place amongst your spirit, amongst your people. Lord, what a blessing that is. And, Lord, when we have needs that we can pray, when we don't know what to do, we can lift our hands. And, 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 Lord, the song that was sung a while ago just expressed it so beautifully, how that we can turn our attention and direction towards you and we're grateful for that. But we pray that you'll receive our gifts tonight, multiply them, make them everything they need to be, and use them, Lord, for the glorification and for the advancement of your kingdom. And we'll honor and bless and praise you for all you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Every time that I lost my way And my head was a mess, now I'm free to say You Your love is what I'm sinking in Let them wash me over Let new life begin Take me deeper still With your love reveal Open up my eyes to see the one Who calls the oceans to be filled Let me in I need to hear your voice it's more than noise So I can know You're not that far Take me deeper still And if the light of my eyes See another thing I can't let go Of the sting of pain
need to go deeper, don't we? We all need to hear his voice. Will you stand and continue to worship with us as we just welcome the Holy Spirit to come and flood not only this sanctuary but our, our, our lives. We need him desperately in the days that we live. We need his power at work in our lives, his direction, his discernment. We really, really need
you will not go where you are not wanted and you are not welcome. So we welcome you into this place tonight. We welcome you into our lives, into our hearts. Let us become more aware of our need for you and of your presence and of your power. We need you so desperately. Father God, we do thank you that wherever, Lord, people allow you to be present, you will fill that place. Fill this atmosphere tonight. Fill this place with your holy presence. Give us ears to hear, Lord. Give us hearts to receive. Give us minds that will weigh what is said. Help us, Almighty God people who will take what we hear and take it to the streets help it to become something Lord that is useful to others Father we thank you in advance for what you're going to do and for what you've already done tonight give you praise and glory and magnify your name the wonderful name of Jesus for his sake and everybody said amen you can be seated sweet sweet presence tonight I want you to turn with me tonight to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. I don't really have a text tonight because I want to I want to move from chapter 7 to chapter 9 to chapter 10, chapter 11. Chapter, I know you're worried about being here a long time. That's not my my goal or purpose tonight. I've heard a lot of words used recently. They're words that we hear a lot. We hear it often. But I guess because of some of the things that's been going on, maybe our, our attention is a little more keen. We've heard words like bipartisan. What we need is bipartisanship. What we need is compromise. Compromise is when both sides give. You move from where you're comfortable. You move from what you like. You move from, from, from your maybe even belief, and you move a distance to get to a common place, both parties, both groups, both whatever it is, can agree upon. Someone has said that marriage is 50-50. That's really not true. Marriage is 100% and 100%. If both partners don't put in 100%, you, you get kind of off kilter and things don't work correctly. If if, if you're only giving 50 and they're only giving 50, that means you're holding on to some and, and, and it's out of balance. And, 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 and well, I understand compromise. You have to do that in marriage sometimes. I said you have to do that in marriage sometimes. Some of y'all scared to say something. <laughs> we had to compromise and we got married on certain brands of stuff we bought at the store. Now, if you like most good southern people, Duke's mayonnaise is all you have. I mean, that just goes without saying. But there's some other things, you know. Maybe I liked Heinz and ketchup, and she liked another brand. I mean, you know, Hunt's. And, and early on, it felt like we needed to war over that. 
you know? I mean, my mom and daddy, but, you know? You like Marita bread, I like sunbeam. What we learned when we first got married, we didn't have a lot of money. We were so glad they had the no-name brand stuff because it was cheaper. And really, brand, brand didn't really have a significance much anymore. You know what I'm saying? There was compromise, whether the toilet paper goes over or under. Do you squeeze the toothpaste wherever you grab it, or do you squeeze from the bottom? I mean, there, there are compromises that we had to make along the way. I understand compromise, but do you understand when it comes to spiritual things, there cannot be compromise. That's the issue that we're struggling with in the day and time in which we live, where it seems that, that they're wanting the parties to, to compromise, but it only seems to... to, to feels like it's only one-sided. It feels like everybody else wants to stay where they are and they're wanting the church and those who believe in God and those who use the word and those who believe in Jesus to be the ones to give. And, 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 it's, and it's got that off-centeredness, that off-kilteredness. Now I've heard uh, words also uh, used here lately, smokescreen. What they're saying is that there's a lot of things that are going on that are creating smoke screens, that are creating diversions, and we aren't really seeing all that's happening because we're so consumed with this issue or that issue. And what, what, what's not happening is, is we're not seeing the totality of everything that's going on. One thing that I have felt so strongly this week is that we need to be reminded as believers we cannot compromise. We can't compromise what we believe about Jesus. We can't compromise what we know about this word. We cannot com compromise what the scripture teaches about certain things. We cannot move away from this word. Now, I don't believe there's anybody in this room who would dare do that. I don't think there's anybody. I'm not, I'm not preaching about compromise tonight because I believe there's anybody in here that is in a, part, in a, in a place of compromise. But I just want to tell you, if, if there are smoke screens in this world, they're not going to get fewer. They're going to, get, I mean, they're going to multiply. And they're going to become more and more. And what I want to do tonight is to show you how compromise can work and how it can appear. And, and just let you put this in your file somewhere so that you can guard against it ever coming your way. Because sometimes people you never thought would ever compromise do. I mean, you see it in the Word. You remember the Scripture, Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen. Quote it with me: If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will, and I will. Now, see, we know that Scripture very well. Matter of fact, it used to hang. Right up over here, if I'm not mistaken, it was this side. Where we had that scripture hanging on that wall for a long time. It was quoted, it was preached on, it was used. We still do it periodically. Come January, February, March, you will hear messages in regards to revival and about how that the Lord said, if my people... you got to go back and understand that the Lord had said, if for some reason I've, I've shut up the windows of heaven and there's no rain, if I shut up the windows of heaven and because of no rain, there's famine in the land. If my people will just humble themselves and pray. We know that scripture well, but do you understand what follows that? Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 19 and 20 says this. If, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them, and this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my sight, and will make it to be a reproach, or a proverb, and a byword among all nations. God said, listen, what I'm going to do is bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you with land. I'm going to bless you with material. I'm going to bless you that you can build a house for me. But I just want you to know, if you ever turn your back on me, if you ever compromise about what you know about me, if you ever move away from my word and my commands, I'm going to take it all away from you. You know, America would do a 
would do a good thing if they would understand we were founded upon God in the Word. And that if we ever compromise on this, God has the power of everything He's blessed us with to take it away from us. Well, it sounds pretty clear forward to me, straightforward. I mean, God says, if, if you ever back away from me, if you, if you ever do that kind of thing, you don't do what I tell you to do, then, then, then I will remove it. I will, I will take it away. I will yank it up. I'll pull it The house of God was built and God continued to bless Solomon. Solomon built his own self a house. He saw the children of Israel be restored to the other cities to live in. Chapter 8 of 2 Chronicles. He appointed priests and Levites to do their duties just as the Lord had commanded his father David to do. And he set it in motion. Solomon was a wise man. He had the wisdom of God. God blessed him and people blessed him. How many like it when people bless you? God blessed him and people blessed him. Matter of fact, some people couldn't believe how blessed he was. There was a queen one time, the queen of Sheba. Listen to what it said, 2 Chronicles chapter 9, if you're following along, verses 5 and 6. She said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land of thine acts and of thy wisdom, howbeit I believed not their words until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the one half of thy greatness of thy wisdom was not told to me, for thou exceedest the fame that I had heard. I couldn't believe what they're telling me until I got here. And what they were telling me isn't one half of what I saw. The blessing of God on him was so great that people didn't even believe it. And people brought in gifts. I'm talking about lumber. How many would like for somebody to drop off a load of lumber at your house? Lumber and gold and silver. Do you understand how wealthy Solomon was? 2 Chronicles 9, 13. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. That's 25 tons. I mean, like to have 25 tons sitting at your house. 50,000 pounds. If it's $1,500 an ounce, that's $1 billion, $200 million worth of gold in one year. That's not all he had. 2 Chronicles 9, 15 and 16 says, King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went to one target. And 300 shields made he of beaten gold. 300 shekels of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Each large shield would be worth $360,000. 200 of them would be $72 million. Each small shield was $180,000. 300 of them would be $54 million. Just the shields alone was $126 million. Glory to God. That's not all he had. 2 Chronicles 9, 17 says, Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. Verse 20 says, All the drinking vessels of King Solomon were gold. All the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. None were silver. It was not anything accounted in the days of Solomon. That's not all. Second Chronicles 9.22 says, King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. You know how this happened? God. Solomon dared to accept and believe God. He dared to stand on the word of God. He dared to stand on the promises of God. And God blessed him and the people. But there's a problem. The book of 2 Chronicles doesn't tell you everything. 1 Kings tells you some things that 2 Chronicles does not tell you. We understand that the end of Solomon's life, some stuff happened. And the Bible tells us that Solomon died. And Rehoboam, his son, became king. And Rehoboam, according to the word, was up and down when it came to serving God. And my question was, how does a son who grows up in the house of Solomon and sees the blessing of God and hears the words of God given to him, how does he get to a place where he's up and down and allows compromise to come to his life? got to go back and look at those shields for a moment. 
Those shields that I told you were worth so much money, those shields hung in the hallway of Solomon's house. Those shields were taken down when Solomon and Rehoboam and the family were going to go to the house of God to worship. Each, each one uh, of the soldiers uh, would take one of those shields and they would line up on both sides a line for Solomon and his family to walk to to get to the house of God. Those shields were made of gold because it represented the provision of God and the protection of God. And they hung on the walls of his house and he walked through them when he was at home or he walked through them to go to the house of worship. Every time being reminded of the provision and of the protection of God. We're going to find out in a moment that something happened with Rehoboam. He came king. And some people came in and stole the golden shields. And instead of Rehoboam making them back with gold, he made them out of brass. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I better slow down. Rehoboam became king. One of the things he did was he sought counsel of men. He didn't go ask God. He didn't seek the Spirit. He didn't go to the Word. He didn't call his spiritual advisors, the, the prophets and the, and the priests together. He sought the advice of men. Can I tell you that unless men are spiritual men and spiritual women, you don't need to listen to everything man may tell you. 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give you me to return to answer to this people? The people were saying that, that Solomon had been a hard taskmaster. And the old men said, Listen, if thou be kind to these people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. So then he calls the young men together. And he says, okay, I, I, I'm bringing you together. He said, this, this shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father had made our yoke heavy, but, but make thou somehow somewhat lighter for us, so that thou can say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon us, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with a whip, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Rehoboam listened to what they said instead of following the word of God, the plan of God, the direction of God. They listened to the words of people. And people said, I tell you what you ought to do. You ought to crack down hard. It's compromise. It's going against what God had said. It's not following the plan of God, the will of God. It's, it's following what people may want you to. And to prove to you that Rehoboam was up and down, you can look at 2 Chronicles chapter 11, verses 14 through 17, and I won't take time to, to read it all. But the last verses say that they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. It didn't say Rehoboam served him all the days of his life. It said they made him strong and he walked in the way of David for three years. So much I want to give you tonight, but I guess I need to skip a little so I don't take too much of your time. Second Chronicles chapter 12 verse 9 says that King Shishak, king of Egypt, came and took the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king's house. He carried away the shields of gold which Solomon had made. I just told you about those shields. Instead of making them back out of gold, he made them out of brass. This shows compromise. If those gold shields show the protection and the provision of God, why was it that he did not make them out of gold? Could it be because of this compromise? Now all of a sudden, the, the flow of gold that was coming in to the, to the place of God no longer is coming anymore. Listen, you can't compromise against God and still expect to keep the blessing of God. If you want the blessing of God, you want the flow of God's blessing in your life, you need to be honest with God, you need to be sincere with God, you need to be in tune with God, you need to be obedient to the Word of God. 
Gold is a pure metal. You can take it and heat it and pour off the impurities. And when you're done, you will get pure gold. But brass is not pure. Brass is inferior. Brass is a pitiful excuse for a substitute of gold. Gold was expensive. Brass was cheap. Gold never had to be polished. Brass had to constantly be polished so it looked shiny. Gold was durable. Brass was flimsy. When you decide you'd rather have that than what God can give you, you are offering a pure substitute for what God can do. That's what compromise was. How does, how does compromise begin? Here's the first thing. It begins when you no longer are totally dependent on God. You want to know what's wrong with our country? We are no longer totally dependent. I love those old pictures. George Washington and the first Congress and all of that was going on when they got in a tough place and they were meeting together and they could not figure out what they ought to do. You will see pictures of them on their knees talking to God. When's the last time anybody in our Senate or House got on their knees in chambers? We don't have time for it. One of the greatest blessings I've ever had in my, my times of attending the General Assembly. I don't even know how many years ago it was, but we were wrangling one of those issues. And they just took a time out, even though it was against Robert's rules of order. Sometimes Robert's rules need to go home. But we took a time out right in the middle of what we were doing and people got on their knees and there was a building full of men and women crying out to God. I want to tell you, when we are no longer dependent on God, we are headed for compromise. What we need is to be dependent on God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the person of the sweet Holy Ghost. We need to be dependent on God. Secondly, we're headed for a compromise when we're no longer obedient to God. That's the whole thing God was telling Solomon. As long as you'll do this, as long as you'll stay true to my word, as long as you'll do what I say, as long as you'll stay close to me, everything will be fine. But as soon as you move away from me, as soon as you become disobedient to this word, I will take it away from you. The scripture says, let God be true. And every man alive. Here's the third way you know you're headed to compromise. When you no longer long to see others come to see the truth about God. We no longer care if people come to Christ or not. We no longer care if people are saved or not. We no longer care. My salvation is not just about me. God never called me to live my life in private to only worship in my closet, to be a secret disciple. God called me to be an open example, to be a light a city setting on a hill whose light cannot be it. The Lord called me to be a visible image of the invisible God. He called me to allow the Jesus in me to come out of me so that people can see what it looks like to have somebody who's been changed by the power of God and to live a Christian life. When we no longer long for others to see God, we are in the throes of compromise. How do you know that you are in compromise? You become more, uh, more human-driven than spirit-driven. You understand what happened to Rehoboam? He did not call the priests. He did not call the Levites. He did not call the spiritual advisors together to pray. He sought human intervention. When you are more concerned about being led by how you feel and what you think and what your posse has to say rather than what God has already said or seeking the face of God for what He may say, you are already in the throes of compromise. When you're more concerned to do it your way, our way, I've watched a ton of videos last, late last night in regards to the two marches and things that happened yesterday, one by the KKK and one by the Black Panther. 
And I've seen, I saw them fight. I saw them run up to people's trucks and yank flags out of trucks and throw bricks. And I, I've seen all kind of things. I heard uh, foul language on both sides. And you know what everybody's forgotten? They've forgotten about those nine people that died and their families who stood in front of a judge front of the man who had killed them and said because of Jesus we forgive they've forgotten about that see those people were exemplifying the grace and the mercy of our Lord they, they remember when Jesus said if somebody slaps you on your cheek turn your other cheek he didn't say pick up a rock and throw it at somebody or, 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 or a brick and, and throw it at somebody's truck you see, what happens is we become so human driven that we forget the spiritual initiative that the Lord has set forth in His Scripture, in His Word. We need to be spirit driven. Spirit driven. Christ led. God directed. Holy Ghost driven. People. Second way you know that you're in the throes of compromise. You're willing to have a substitute instead of the genuine. When Rehoboam hung those brass shields up on the wall, he was saying to his family and to everybody else that would see them when they marched from there to the temple that a substitute is just as good as the original. Friend, I want to tell you, there's nothing better than this. There is nothing that can replace there's nothing that will ever replace the protection and the provision that God Almighty can give. And when you are willing to accept a substitute instead of the original, you are saying that God didn't really hold up His end of the bargain and I don't really need Him anymore. I'll handle this myself. No, you won't. There will always come a time that we have to pay for when we've been disobedient to the Lord. How do you know if you're in compromise? You keep making appearances rather than repentance. You keep putting on like everything's all right. You keep showing up on Sunday and you lift your hands and you sing in the choir and you teach a class and you get behind the pulpit and preach and you sing instruments and play and you sit on your pew and you put money in your plate. You make the appearance that everything is okay. The truth is, if you're in compromise, it's not okay. What we need is not an appearance. What we need is repentance. What we need is to get on our face and cry out to God, forgive me, help me, change me. What we need is to go back to 2 Chronicles 7 and 4 and hear the voice of God say that my people will just humble themselves and pray and repent. Repent. Quit acting like it's all right. Quit acting like it's okay. Quit putting on the dog. Listen. A lot of us put on the dog all the time. I have problems just like you. I saw something the other day. If I don't change my mind, I'm going to run it in the bull. About the way we ought to respond on social media. Some of us just, uh, we put everything in the brother on there. Great day. You know what? I think we ought to be cautious. I think we ought to be careful. I think we ought to be slow. I think what we put needs to be very well thought through if we're going to do it. It ought to be edifying to the body. It ought to be edifying to God. We all have problems, but sometimes the, the worst thing we can do is let everybody know what our problems are. But sometimes what people want to do is out, outdo your problem. Oh, your, your left leg hurts. Well, my left and my right one hurt. Woo! Pray for me. Oh, I'm not against prayer. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is, is that sometimes what we need to do is take it to the one who can provide all things for us. 
take it to the Lord in prayer. I understand that there are hard things and heavy things and, and that there's power in numbers. That if one can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight, what would happen if my whole church body agreed with me that I could be healed? I understand that and I believe in that. But brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that sometimes what we do is we broadcast when we aren't really asking for prayer. We just want everybody to know our problem. And they're out there praying about your problems and you don't even pray about your own problems. We want everybody else to pray that our family will be saved. We aren't even praying for our own family. What I'm saying is, is we're putting on the appearance that we're okay. But what we may need to do is repent. Do what he said. Let, 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 let God hear us from heaven. Let him hear us with a humble heart. Crying out before him, oh God, I'm sorry, I repent. And you know what he said he would do? He would hear from way up there where he's at, he would forgive your sin and heal the land. Solomon had heard God say, I'm going to keep a king ruling over those people. Just stay close to me. Stay close to my word. And if you don't, if you don't compromise, if you compromise, you're going to have to pay. But you know what God did? God bless Solomon. God bless Rehoboam. They go to the temple. They worship. God blesses Solomon dies. Rehoboam becomes king. And he compromises. How does that happen? How does it happen? How does Rehoboam, who grew up in his father's house, how does it happen? Remember I told you 1 Kings tells you things that 2 Chronicles doesn't. You know what 1 Kings chapter 11 says? That Solomon loved many strange women. It says that the Lord had already told him not to go into them and not to have anything to do with them. Don't let them come into you. Verse 2 of 1 Kings 11 says, Solomon clave unto these in love. The very thing God said don't do, Solomon did. His wives turned away his heart. Solomon is old. Verse 4, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. Verse 6, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. And went not fully after his God. Verse 9 says, The Lord was angry with Solomon. Verse 14 says, The Lord stirred up an adversary under Solomon. How does Rehoboam get to a place of compromise? Because he watched his own father. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. And I've told you before, but I want you to hear me. When we make decisions, it does not just affect us personally. It affects our family. It affects our wife. It affects our children. It affects your husband. It affects your children. It'll affect your grandchildren. It'll affect your friends and those round about you. You don't just make decisions and you're the only one it affects. It affects everybody around you. While Solomon had followed God most of his life, in his older age, he allowed people that should have never been in his life to come into his life and turn his heart away from the Lord his God. What is the last thing Rehoboam sees about his dad? He sees his dad in compromise. So when Rehoboam becomes king, It's the freshest thing on his mind. It's the freshest thing his eyes saw. It is the freshest thing his ears heard. I don't know how you feel tonight, but I don't want to live my life for a long time serving God and find myself down at the end of my life doing something foolish. I don't want to get down to the end of my life and be guilty of compromise. And it's so affecting my own life that it affects my family and it affects people that are close to me. Listen, there may not be anybody in here. 
who's even thought of compromise. But I'm just giving you some teaching tonight to help you understand that just because you've served him a long time doesn't mean that the devil is not going to try to get you to skip Jesus and skip God and skip the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mean that he will not bring people around your life that will try their best to confuse you and to, and to move you away from your very core values of beliefs. Oh, it'll never happen to me, I'm sure. That's the same thing Solomon said after having all the blessing of God, but he compromised and it affected his son. He thought of an old course. I am determined to hold out till the end. Jesus is with me. On him I can depend. And I know I have salvation for I feel it in my soul. I am determined to hold out. Till the end. I just want to know, is anybody determined to hold out? Amen. I said, is anybody determined to hold out? Amen. You remember I told you this morning, sometimes you just need to hear, your ears just need to hear your mouth say it. Just in case there's a devil around. Just in case there's a demon around. Just in case there's something that's supposed to jump up on your shoulder and say, now listen, don't pay attention to what he's saying. I want you to say it out loud. I am determined Say it. To hold out to the end. Glory to God. I'm going to hold to God's unchanging hand. I'm going to hold to the unchanging, powerful, mighty, holy hand of God. I'm not going to turn him loose. Glory to God. Help me, Lord. Tonight, again, I don't believe there's anybody in this room who's in a place of comfort. Somehow or another, I just, don't, I just don't think that. It's not my purpose today. My purpose is to warn you to be careful. I told you not too long ago about you know, some of the things you do as a parent when your kids are learning to drive. Things they're doing for the first time. You're, you warn them and you talk to them and you tell them and you teach them. And then when it comes time that you have to let them do it, you hide in places to watch to see if what you told them was really happening. Jonathan drove for the first time to get his hair cut. I hid in the parking lot of the car wash next to the dumpster. Just to make sure he put his signal on like I told him. Just to make sure he didn't take an unnecessary risk and cut it too close with cars coming toward him. I just wanted to make sure he was listening to what I was saying. See, sometimes I trusted him. It was the other, I start to say idiots, but I guess I'm in church. It was the other drivers that I didn't trust. You see, the truth is, God's given us his word. He understands that what he's told us is right and helpful. But he just wants sometimes us to be reminded that what his word says is what his word meant. And that for your best good, it behooves you to go by the Word of God and to follow the Word of God and to keep yourself held on to the mighty hand of God and to stay away from every possible compromise. Tonight, I want us to have a, a time where we sing where we worship this God that we believe in, that we build inside of ourselves the strength, the power, the presence of God. And just by chance, we've allowed there to be substitutes in our life for the real thing. It would be a great time. A great time. You know, sometimes we do that. We, uh, we start substituting other things for our devotional time with God. I'm going to listen to this and I'm going to do that. And nothing, nothing takes the place of getting along with Him and sitting with the Word in your lap or on the table in front of you and, and reading it and then stopping and saying, Okay, God, speak to me. 
nothing takes the place of that. We can substitute a lot of things that are good and we can go through the motions, but, but if, if we've substituted for the, for the real, it would be a great time to say, okay, God, you know what? I'm not compromised. And if I don't fix some of these things, it can take me a place I don't want to go. I want, I want the real thing to speak for you, God. I want the real thing to say you're a God of provision and protection. I don't want it to be a cheap imitation. I want it to be the real thing because I want people to know that you're a God of power, a God of strength, a God of majesty, a God of might. I want people, if they want you, will know who to go to to find you. Not be confused about you. Not a secret disciple. Not a closet worshiper. Somebody who's not afraid in public to talk about you, and to converse with people about you. And if people ask me to pray, I'm not going to try to go in a back alley somewhere. I don't mind laying my hands on you and praying for you, right? They are. Father God, I bring the people to you tonight. Lord, I'm concerned in these last days with all that I see going on in this great country of ours. All this compromise and attempt to be bipartisan. I understand the need to be bipartisan on some things, to give and take, to reach a common good. God, there are just some things we can't do that. There's some, some things that we just cannot, the, the who, who God is, we cannot compromise on that. We can't say, well, you know what, many people call him by many different names. It's all the same God. No, it's not. We cannot compromise there. His, his name is God. He's Jehovah. He's Yahweh. There is no other Elohim. There is no other one. It is him and him alone. There is no other way to get to him but Jesus. It is the shed blood of Jesus. It is the blood. We can't compromise on that. We can't back off and say, oh, that's a gory religion. It is a fact. It was the shed blood of Jesus. There is nothing else. Tell us, oh God, to stand tall, stand firm. Even when it may cost us to make a stand for you. Lord, I saw a picture today. 200 and something Kenyans that were slaughtered inside. It looked like a school because they said they were Christian. We're living in the last days for real, for sure. But oh God, it is only what we are absolutely committed to and sure of that will hold us and will keep us and will get us to where our destiny is and that is heaven. But it'll never be done with compromise. It'll only be done with people who are standing firm, holding to the unchanging hand of God. I pray tonight, God, that through our worship and through our words, that we will commit ourselves to you afresh and anew. And that you'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are committed to you. I am determined to hold out to the end. I'm going to hold to the unchanging hand of God. Would you mind standing all over the building tonight? And I'm just asking you, if you would, would you mind pushing this way? I just think there's something about us being... This is a statement we're saying together as brothers and as sisters, as the church body at Woodruff Church of God, that we are determined we're going to hold out to the end. We're not going to compromise. We're going to stay away from it. We're going to push away from it. We're going to resist it because we want the protection and the provision of God in our life. And we're going to hold on to the truth of the Word of God and the reality of who God is. And we're standing there in the name of Jesus. Just talk to him. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging Changing hands to 
to your word. I will hold on to you. I will keep my eyes focused on you. I will be directed toward you. I ask you to help me stand against every compromise and to be true to you in the name of Jesus. I want you to find you somebody that you can pray with. We're going to sing it again. I want you to pray. Not only you just pray for yourself. I want you to pray for somebody. Just lay your hand on them. Wrap your arm around them. Touch them on the side. Do whatever. But just pray for them. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Hold oh, to God's unchanging hand.
is build your hope on things eternal. That's what will keep you away from compromise. When everything you do has a spiritual purpose behind it. I'm not talking about going to Broncos and eating, but that's a holiness piece of quesadilla. You're eating. I'm talking about everything you do, even, even where you buy your home, where your home is located. I believe that God can put you in a place strategic. When you, when you buy a house and move somewhere, that God can put you in the middle of a bunch of people who don't even know who Jesus is, and you can become light in a dark place. I'm talking about even where you work, that God may want to send you somewhere, and you say, well, Lord, that's not the place that's going to pay me the most money. It may be the greatest harvest field God has ever put you in your life. Build your hopes on things eternal and hope to God's unchanging hand. Father God, I feel good in my heart today. I feel good in my spirit today, Lord. My, I repeatedly say, and I want to say it again, I don't believe there's anybody in this room who's in compromise. That was not my purpose tonight. My purpose, Lord, is to warn. My purpose is to, to try to help the people to be prepared. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what else may change round about us, round about us. But this one thing I know, we must be settled on what we believe about Jesus. We must be settled in what we believe about God. We must be settled in what we believe about the Word of God. We must have our hopes built in things eternal. Because, Lord, if we compromise on that at all, the things that you blessed us with, you have the power to remove it and take it from us. So I pray, God, tonight that as we stood around this front and as we sang and we prayed and we prayed for each other, God, will leave this place knowing that, God, we are committed to holding to your unchanging hand. That, Lord, we have, we have made up our mind. We're bound and determined that we're going to hold out till the end. God, I believe we're going to do that today. Bless us, Lord, as we leave this place tonight. May we go empowered by your presence. Be with us all through the week, whatever we're doing, Lord. Prayer meeting on Monday or, or round table uh, meeting on Tuesday or joy club on Thursday or, or wherever we may be, whatever we are doing, let us let the light of Christ shine out through us that others can see him in us. I pray it today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God bless you. Amen. Hope you have a great night. Sing it as you go. Oh, to God's 